Hello, today I'm going to be making a, an, an Australian red fox blanket using these skins, which are made of Australian, these are Australian feral foxes. Um, they're English common red fox um, that are wild in Australia. Now, they don't belong here and they cause a lot of environmental damage, a lot of um, damage to stock and property. Uh, and so people are paid a bounty to shoot them we used to, Australia used to export millions of these skins worldwide every year, but not anymore. Um, because of the anti-fur movement, Australia no longer has a fur industry to consume the skins, and so the animals multiply unabated, except for a, a government poisoning program and uh, sports shooters, that's about it. So we have all these foxes running around Australia, but um, very hard to get your hands on the skins. So what I have here are skins that were shot on people's properties, you know, uh, on behalf of the property owners, and then they bring them to me and I fix them up and turn them into blankets or clothes or hats or whatever people want. So we can make uh, some use out of these animals, which are otherwise a scourge. So this skin has been uh, repaired. It had, a, it had some damage here, which I've removed, and some holes here, which I've repaired, and some splits here. And now it's been nailed, so I've wet it and nailed it. This is just a test skin to see how it came out, and it, it's come out very nicely. Uh, this one is particularly good because it, I didn't really have to do much to it. However, the rest of them, out of the 18 skins, only 14 were usable. Um, a lot of them have bald patches, like this, which is just from poor handling of the skins after the animal was shot. Uh, this one is made out of two different animals. Obviously, the left-hand side of, of this one was no good and the right hand side of that one was no good so I put them together and made one composite skin and uh, pa put patches in here and there and uh, of course those bullet patches in this case will be cut off but in all the other cases all the bullet patches all the damage has to be removed so this one that one's ready to be nailed uh, this one you can see has had quite a lot of repairs to it so it's been damaged out here and here and here and here and here and that but that's ready to be nailed now um, this one uh, is completely unusable it's a really nice looking skin on the face of it but it's absolutely covered in ball patches usually we look at a skin like this in four sections and like this and try and find if there's a good section that we can transplant onto another one or how we can go about repairing it. But in the case of this fox, all four quadrants contain significant bald patches and damage. So I've labeled him too many baldies and he's got a bloody great bullet hole as well. Um, so no, he's uh, not usable. He just has no redeeming features. Um, some of them have bits missing. This was an enormous bullet hole, but I've transplanted a piece from another fox. I keep all my old offcuts from other jobs. And so I, this is just the throat section. I may not even use it, but you can't nail it with a huge piece missing. So I've repaired that one and he's ready for nailing. Um, this one, a massive bullet hole here. Um, again, you're looking at an amateur shooter here, not a professional sport shooter, just probably the farm himself. Um, I've put patches in here, here, and this massive one here. Even, even the bit I put from another fox in the same group had a baldy in it, so I had to fix that. I mean, they're, they're really nice looking foxes, but unfortunately they were badly handled and they weren't well looked after by the skin dresser or the tannery, whoever did it, should have been smacked, really. <laughs> this one just had some simple bits of damage like that. You often get little, uh, you know, holes and things. But I think what they were trying to do is they fleshed the skin down too far. And if you take off too much off the back, it uh, damages the skin follicles and the hair falls out. Uh, here you can see the flanks of this are completely bald, but it doesn't matter because I won't be using them anyway. 
um, yeah so this one again the entire shoulder section is not there it was just blown away by a huge caliber rifle um, instead of using a small caliber rifle and getting a headshot they just shot them all any old way they liked um, but I have again transplanted a matching piece from another fox that I owned um, this one yeah it's just a few minor repairs and it's all right notice that I've marked a line down the middle of most of them that's so that when I join them up into a blanket I can match the centers so you can, I can match everything to these lines these all seem quite good this one was tanned in a different way all the ones of uh, previous ones that have an alum tan this, isn't done, this, this one's done being done with mercury salts which makes it it's a bit tougher but it does last longer it's probably incredibly toxic and it'll kill me but oh well something's gonna kill you yeah anyway the boy is death with all of these but out of the 18 skins i was only able to salvage 14 but it's better than none and these these ones yeah so and notice how they're all different sizes i've got some big ones some small ones so although i've uh, damaged out all the other skins this one hasn't turned out quite the way i wanted it um it still has this big chunk missing um which uh, you can see on the other side i thought when i nailed it that uh, like a lot of times when you nail you can correct a lot of imbalances while the skin is wet but this didn't happen it seems to be and that's just the way the animal was skinned poorly always there's job big that i fixed that bit see can't tell folks that's pretty good i patched that that's a piece out of another fox that i had in a box somewhere anyway this side's no good so i found another bit from another fox in the same box so i'm going to put him i'm going to put this flank back in and have i'll have to nail him again well we we nail in case you're wondering so that the uh we can stretch the, the skin to its maximum size and get the maximum use out of it. Um, but also gives us the opportunity when we join things together to give them the same surface tension. Um, and that's why when you join furs together, they hang together like a, not like a nice drop of fabric, not like a lumpy old thing. So anyway, we've got this hole and we're going to fix it. So this is the flanks that I've stolen from another fox and the reason I've chosen this one is because this fox had a dark smoky flank, same as this fox. Red foxes can either have a, you know, a white flank, silver flank, gray flank, or this one's quite a charcoal color. Very pretty fox. Anyway, I'm going to put this piece in here. So, you see it's a great big chunk that's missing and I want to feel about that much. This edge has nail holes in it, so I'm going to remove those. I'll take my fur knife, which is actually half a razor blade in a holder. It's very sharp. So you pierce the skin, go around the nail holes, give myself a nice smooth line to follow for the repair. Ah, you bloody thing. I'm trying to make this fit for the camera. Normally I wouldn't care, I'd just be, I've done this already. But anyway, there you go. There's a nice smooth arch shape that I should be able to follow. There we go. Now, we line this new piece up with that area. So as you can see, that's the back of Fox. Oh God, is the bloody thing gone? Oh, is that the right one? Yes, here we go. So as you can see, that's the flank of... This one is uh, this colour because it was very greasy when I got it uh, from the man who did this, who did the... He shot the fox and he dressed it. But it was very greasy, so I used red gum sawdust to, uh, to blot up all the extra grease and the, as you can see the red gum has stained the skin but anyway it doesn't matter as the old man who taught me said used to say it doesn't matter john no one will see it no one will see it john 
Anyway, so we're going to put this nice piece of dark smoky flank into there. I think that section there is about right. We want to maybe start it about there. So I'll put a mark here. Now, I'm just going to cut this section off. Oh, let me use that. I'll cut that off, she says. Cut that off. And that's plenty there because we go into this sort of bare patchy thing there. So we'll just get rid of that. And put them back in the useful box. Yeah, just so you can see. I'm going to put this in there. So go around like that. You can see where the nail holes are on that and the nail holes are there from where it used to be there. Where it was nailed. So we want these, it's very hard for you to see, isn't it? No. Wish I had close-ups, wish I had a cameraman, so that'd be good, but I don't, it's just daggy old me. Anyway, we line up these edges here with those there, so we can affect this. Now, so that it doesn't move, I'm going to get some tacks, some fur tacks. This is very old-fashioned. Because most furriers these days, I'd say 99.9% .9 of them use staples and don't use pins or anything like this. I think they'd be watching this thinking, who's this old fossil? And why is he bothering fixing these when you can just buy nice fresh farmed ones without any damage on them? Like they do in all the other demo videos. <laughs> these people live these gilded lives where they get to work with perfect new skins all the time. Unlike me, I work with old damaged things all the time. But anyway, I'd rather do that than uh, kill anything we don't have to. It's sad we have to kill the foxes, but you can't have foxes and native animals and, and happy farmers. And as a child, I watched uh, our ducks and chickens being eaten mauled by foxes. It's really quite disgusting. They're not very fair hunters. They like to go into the chicken coop or the duck coop and kill everything so that nobody squawks and tells tales. They kill the lot and take the ones they can and bury them nearby. They usually kill every single hen in the hen house. They'll maul ducks. They'll eat them alive. I used to find my poor old ducks in the morning with their wings eaten off by the fox, but they wouldn't get off their eggs. We just ate her alive. I had to cut her head off. Poor thing. She was in agony. The fox didn't care, he was hungry. So, not a big fan of the feral fox. The Australian feral fox can go to hell for all I care. Best use for an Australian feral fox is fur. Kill them, kill them, kill them. But uh, we want we want the ones with these nice winter coats, nice plush coats. We don't want the old scrawny old mangy ones you see roaming around the suburbs in Melbourne. You don't want those. We want the nice ones from the high country with nice thick pelts. Don't want summer skins of anything really. Okay, and notice I put those marks on so that I can locate it after I've cut it out. So now I've cut it out, put it back, and I've put all those marks so I can't possibly put it back in the wrong spot. So now I'll take it to the sewing machine and I'll put it together. So here I am at my 1950s uh, All Book and Hashfield Success Fur Machine and we'll be uh, putting this patch in. I should say that it's taken me three days to fix all those other ones. So this is the last one and I'm going to bore you to death with three days worth of that. Anyway, here we go. So li lining up the marks on the skin like that. 
We'll start with the one in the middle. Put it in the cups of the machine, like this. Brilliant machine, whoever invented this. Bloody genius. It's a V8, I should point out. Put a few stitches there, like that. It has a little cutter, so you don't have to use snips. I do use snips on old fur, though, because you don't want to yank on, you know, 70-year-old urn and it'll just tear. But this skin's all, you know, not too old. It's never been used before. You put all these, join all these little bits together. The machine only works one way. And as you can see, the, uh, the needle goes across. It's bloody brilliant. This last tiny little bit, look. And the last tiny little bits of the, of the skin. And on the other side you can see nothing, no sign that it was ever... Oh, that's a terrible joint, look at that, I tell you. So this is how you unpick it. It's got a, a locking stitch. Just undo that. Ugh. The bloody thing here. And now, just go back this way, and I join them all together. Look at that, what a brilliant bloody machine. Goes around corners, just catching the last couple of millimetres. I've got quite a few of them. <laughs> this is my favourite one. I bought it from an, a, a lady farrier called Anita Rob. Lovely lady. Anyway, so I can just turn it on my lap here. Oh, so you can see. So you can see the patch. Just flatten it, flatten the seam a bit. So now you can see the patch is added and although the back is a different colour, the front is the same colour. We use this tool which is a seam roller. They still make exactly the same uh, device, just a piece of wood, a piece of beech with a brass roller on it. It flattens the seam for you. It also gives you the opportunity to see if you've missed any bits. of the extra threads or anything that might come undone. We flip it over and you can see we've got a nice uh, dark piece that'll be trimmed off like that so it'll match this dark piece on the other side. Um, the ginger hair there's a little dark just like here so it fits really well we give it a brush and you're right it's just a dog brush. What else is a fox with a member of the dog family? Anyway, there you go. All fixed. It's a little little thing there I don't like the look of. Yeah. <laughs> yes, ladies and gentlemen, it's another bloody bald patch. Look. This these skins I just have to I've never seen so many bald patches in all my life. Crikey. But they don't have to fix all this rubbish at Saga. Watch their videos. They've got money to burn. Anyway, so as you can see, it's got this bloody great bald patch, which is no good. So we're going to have to get rid of it. Right, so there's the bald patch. We found it and we have to get rid of it because it's too, it's not close enough to the edge to cut off. It'll, it will show. That's why these things take days to do and why we always prefer it if the, if the skins don't need a lot of preparation. But remember, every garment you've ever seen 
from the old days made of wild skins. Some poor person had to go over every single skin and remove every single fold. So if you ever open up an old fur and you see lots of little uh, stitches and things that you don't understand, why are they there? They're there because some poor person damaged them out. So what we do is we find it from this side. It's not visible from the other side. And we put pins, we prick pins into the perimeter of the ball patch like this little pins and you just pierce it like that around the edge to describe it on the other side so you know what you have to remove and what you have to get rid of. We'll see the edge of it. Oh, it's a pain. It takes so long. Oh. But, you know, nobody wants a blanket with a ball patch in it. I've got to say, these blankets aren't cheap. <laughs> They're much cheaper if it's quicker. The ones that require a lot of work cost more. It's just days and days of, before I can even make it into anything, I've got to um, get the skins, and they all have to be the same size and, and everything. So some of them will be brutally cut down, others will be just the right size. And it's terribly wasteful sometimes, but anyway. Okay, so I've got all those pins in there. I'll flip it over. And can you see that? It's a little ring of, of uh, uh, pin tips. So I get my pencil. These are Chinagraph pencils. Um, by Stapler. They're really good for writing on fur. And they come in lots of different colours, so if you're writing on the back of natural fur like this, you can use a dark pencil. And some of them are dyed black or brown and they'll have a dark back on them. And so you can just change colours to white or yellow or green or whatever you like. Okay. So you can see I've fixed a little thing there. So I thought this was just a little a little hole, but it wasn't, it's actually a ball patch. So you get your pencil and you just uh, mark on the outside of each pin like that. And that shows me the shape. So it's this teardrop shape. To mark the top of it. Like that. And now I have to <laughs> work out how on earth I'm going to fix it. Okay, so I've looked around and I've found a piece of fox from another, a bit of my useful red fox uh, collection. Just a bit of off cuts. And I think this one um, is the right kind of character for here. I think that looks about the same. It's not a big patch, so hopefully nobody will see it. So we're going to drop this one in. You might think, why don't we just, you know, plug it up with a piece that's the same shape and everything. But they can be very difficult to get in and flat and straight. So what we're going to do is we're going to drop it in. We often do these near the bottom. I could try doing this teardrop shape, and but I, I just don't think it's going to work. I think it's going to pucker. So I put the the set square around it like this and I can see that it's four centimeters long and about 18 millimeters wide. So I draw around it like this all the way down to the bottom of the skin. I come across to 18 millimeters. I go down here and I mark 18 millimeters here 18 millimeters lucky this one's been nailed so it's nice and flat usually they're not so flat as this so it's a nice straight drop straight to the bottom why is that one so far away mm, it's not so accurate is it oh well that'll do color and movement ladies and gentlemen color and movement <laughs> that like that. Now the injury itself is we'll call it oh, I don't 
don't like that piece of stitching there. Um, 45. So it's 45 long by 18 wide. So that's the size patch we need to make out of this. So it's close to that size, it's 50 by 20 and a bit. So we'll use that line that's already on it from something else. You've always got to have wreckers in the fur business. You've got to have wrecker garments and uh, wrecker skins that you can use to patch other ones. So anything I've got that's still salvageable, I'll keep. Waste not, want not. Especially with old furs, you know, you're repairing old furs. These aren't old, but most of the things I work on are very old. You can't put new skin in a repair for an old skin. Because the colour's faded or yellowed or changed in some way, or the animals just aren't available anymore. There's lots of furs, fur animals in, aren't in the trade anymore. They're just not used. So, it's now, we've made that shape. It's 45 by 18. I thought we can get a really nice um, drop out of that. We're going to um, cut this out. Oh, did you see any of it? Oh my God. Anyway, we're going to cut this out. Pierce the skin there. Only using the tip of the knife so you don't cut anything except the hair that's under that line. Using your pinky finger as a guide, sort of dragging it down like that. It takes a lot of practice to do nice straight lines like that, but you just need confidence. You've got to start chopping things up. Otherwise you'll be too scared. So, take it out and there's the baldy in there, which we don't want, so we'll cut him off. Normally I wouldn't do it like this, but I'm doing it so you can see. Can you see that? Yes. Even that up a bit. Right. Now I take the new piece and I trim that to size. Squares are easier than teardrops, I'm telling you, or rectangles. Right angles. I love right angles. Although in most repairs we try and use a V or a chevron shape so that it flutes back into the hair very nicely, but it's not practical in this sense. What we want is a rectangle or a square, no shape. Now we sew that to that, and then we drop the whole thing in. Then it all takes on the same surface tension and you can't see the join. So we'll go over to the machine and we'll put this in. So back at the machine and I'm going to be joining these two edges together and then I'll be putting them back into the fox skin. Get the machine. Gentlemen, start your engines. Give a little lift. 
just pinch a bit of skin and shorten. It's because the hair is different lengths. And so you can see the gap. And now the gap's disappeared. You can't see it now. It's a little bit of white hair, but I can just pluck that out. <laughs> no one will see it, John. <laughs> anyway, it's not too bad. See how it looks. See how it looks. Because if I don't like it, I'll have to try something else. It seems to go okay. Yeah, I think that'll work. Yeah. So we'll go ahead and put it in. The only thing is. Sometimes when you do it and you look at it and you go, oh, I don't like it, you can always try something else. With fur, fur sewing, it's very easy to undo the stitches and uh, try it again. Because sometimes it's just, it's just trial and error. You know, you're borrowing stuff from other skin and patching up these jolly things. Bomb this in, as we say. You know, little crinkly bits that just got squashed in. It's very forgiving fur, it's very. Not all of it, but uh, long haired fur is yeah, pretty good. Get in. I hope no other furriers watch this. Yeah, we do swear. Okay. Well, I don't. I'm trying to swear on this. We do swear a lot. I'm going to drop in this side. It's a very satisfactory way of, of doing a repair because once it nails the ent that entire panel uh, sort of integrates much better than if you try and just put an isolated patch in. Why it is that way, I don't know, but it's just always very, very effective. Because, you know, doing ones from the side isn't so bad. But not so difficult because yeah, it's much easier to get off cuts of flank to put in there and things like that but when you're trying to take something out of the centre back of an unrelated skin it's very difficult anyway the two sides done and now the top So here we are, back we've done it. We're going to use the seam roller again. Stretch the skin as we do it. Get it flattened. Let's hope that the hair length is right and all that kind of stuff. If it is, then I'll have to try something else. Beautiful. And on this side, we give it a brush. You can just see it here, you see it here. It's a little bit redder than the stuff around it, but once that's nailed and then the skin is squared off and trimmed like that, and when all the skins are laid out, you won't even see it. Oh, there it is, yep. The best, uh, the best repair is one you can't see. There, that's not a bad one. That's a pretty good repair, really. That one, that's the other one we did. You're going, oh, that looks terrible, but it won't. It won't. You can see it now. But in the broader scheme of things, in the larger picture, you won't see it. Oh, yes, you can. You can see it. I hate it. I think I'll do it again. I don't like it. No, it looks bad. Let's do it again. Okay, so I didn't like that repair. 
I, you know, even though it's in a blanket and all that kind of stuff, I didn't like it. And plus, the piece I put in had baldies in it, after all. So what I've done is, what I usually do in those situations, um, although not with ones that are 45 uh, millimeters long, usually if they're about 20 mil, something like that, all you do is you, you cut the piece out and you just move it up and rejoin it to the skin here, which is what I've done. Even though it's 45 long, it doesn't show on the other side. Um, but of course, now this piece of skin is too short. So I found an off cut from another piece and I'm going to add it to the end. So you can see it's easier to match down here in the rump than it is up here in the middle of the body. So I'm going to add that to the bottom and that should make it then the right length and again a decent repair or one I won't hate too much. All right now so I don't lose that bit. Oh god I can't find anything. Oh well I had some pins here some oh there they are. So I'll just pin that on there so I don't lose it and we'll try that and hopefully that will work or I won't hate it. As long as I don't hate it. That's the bit I hated. Yes, folks, I found another ball patch. Ugh. It may not be such a big deal, but I better get rid of it. This is another, this is a bit of a masterclass in how to get rid of these rotten things. Anyway, so here's another one. It's sort of a crescent shape, which is good because the crescent shape is easier to remove in a different way. Now, this is in a position where I'll probably only use just a tiny bit, but that's exactly the position it's fallen into. Ah, damn it. Anyway, so we're, again, we're putting the pins in around the edge of the, of the bald patch. Ooh. Why I order, if I found the guy who did this, I would, I don't know, I'd slap him silly. <laughs> Far out, what a mess. Ay, ay, ay. Gewalt. Ay. Mm, what does that look like? <laughs> a cluster of, you know what? What a mess. So basically that's the shape. That's the shape of the ball patch. I haven't made a template for these yet, so I'm not sure exactly what size they're going to be. And this may very well, nah, this is gonna end up in the general scheme of things. So we'll have to get rid of that too. Now I've got a couple of alternatives. I can actually find a replacement piece from another fox. So I can have a look through my collection of pieces and see what I can find. Or I can make a crescent shaped lift out of here because really all I want, I want this section to remain. I think the fox will be cut out around here because this is right in the way. So we need to get rid of it. So it may be a simple matter, or it may be... So in any case, let's say that's the edge. We can drop it out this way. We'll drop it out that way. And probably this way offers me a bigger piece to move in. So I'm thinking maybe what if I do that? I do that and 
and I drop, I go to that edge. Okay, so I eliminate this and move this piece in. Can you see that? No, you probably can't. Yeah, so I want to eliminate this section. So if I cut, cut that out and then move this section in, what will it look like? Will it look like there's a huge piece missing or will your eye accept that it's okay? I, I'm going to try it. If it doesn't work, then what I've got to do is replace this leg section. Find something from another garment, or oh, sorry, from another skin, and uh, drop it in. So let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. So I'm going to cut right through there. Oh, it's tough around the edges. Woo! Definitely not skins by Saga or Ember or any of those big places. Let's make sure there's no bald patches there. Nope, that's nice and clean. So we've got this big section here. You can see all the bald patches in there. So we're going to remove them, or eliminate them. What we always try and do first, eliminate all the faults, all the bad bits, and then see what's left. And what can we do with it? Okay, so this section here contains the bald patches. Gone. And this section, by the look of it, doesn't contain any. So we're going to see if we can maybe manipulate this a bit, warm it up, a bit of heat into it, make it stretch a little bit more. And as you can see, it fits the hole better because <laughs> I made it. That's what furriers do. We persuade things to do what we want them to do. And hopefully we don't destroy it in the process. As things you can do like this with new skins, with the old skins, you wouldn't dare do that. So let's see what happens when we tip it over and put it in there and just see how it might look. Does it look bad? Does it look all right? I don't think it looks too bad. Should I sew it in and see if I hate it? Let's see how it compares. As you can see, because the way the skin is produced is an open-handled wild skin. The arm, the other, the other four, foreleg, should be up here, but it's not. It's down there, so it's not symmetrical anyway. But if I put that in, I think the eye accepts that that's normal. So what I'm going to do is I'll sew that in and uh, there's another baldy gone and please let that be the last one. Oh don't uh, look and I'm still looking. Stop looking. I can't help it. I love everything to be perfect. Anyway let's put that in and see. Okay so I sewed that in, removed the bald patch and put the forepaw back there so we'll still get a, the right size out of this line so when it's folded like that the side of the skin will look like that and the repair is no longer visible when you put it like that you can't see it okay so finally all 14 skins are ready to nail so i'm going to go and eat my lunch and when i come back we're going to start nailing them for god's sake Hi everyone, so I'm going to start unnailing the foxes that we still have uh, nailed up on these boards. So just have a, oh, it's not that interesting, but I'll show you how it's done. Okay. So we just pull them out with our fur pinches, unless you're lucky enough to have one of these 
which is a nail puller, which I'm sure isn't, uh, isn't widely available anymore. Um, and you just do it like this, starting at the rump. It's a marvelous invention. <laughs> it takes them all out for you. It's wonderful. The edges are, are not so easy. And I don't really, um, some of these skins are a bit dodgy around the edges. So, um, great invention. You can tip them up like that and tip them out into a receptacle. But no. Anyway, it's getting a bit hairy around there, so. And they're not in a straight line. Or you can do it uh, how I normally do it, because most of the time I'm working with old fur and I wouldn't ever use one of these on old fur because it pulls at it too much. So I just take them out one at a time, like that. And you put them all back in the tin. So now I've got to clean all this mess up. So I don't know if it's really a labor saving device. I'm sure if you were doing hundreds of things every day and you had somebody to pick up all the jolly nails, then that would be a good idea. Anyway, there it is on the other side. Uh, it's got this huge patch in it here, which you can't see anymore because the surface tension is now the same and uh, it just blends in quite seamlessly. And uh, when we reset, the, when we set the rug, which is where we, you know, spritz it with water and brush it all. Um, any of these joints just sort of disappear. Even with just a simple combing. Invisible. So now I'm going to do the rest of them and uh, it'll all just be basically like that. step is to grade the skins and the skins um, some will be larger than others so there'll be some large and some smaller ones maybe some medium ones so what we're going to do is we're hoping that out of the 14 there'll be seven large and seven smaller uh, so what we can do is we can put the shorter ones the smaller ones on the top row and the larger ones on the bottom row and uh, thereby uh, maximizing uh, the use of the fox skins so I'm going to show you how to do that. The thing we have to do is also, besides size, is the color and character of the skin. So we kind of have to match those. So when you look at it, it all looks so intentional and that that one matches that one and it looks really nice and it flows really nicely. So that was, that's included as well. So while I flub around and do things, you'll hopefully you'll be able to follow what I'm doing. So I've decided that this is the largest uh, fox of all of them. I fold the, folded them all in half, and that way it makes it easier to match, which I'll show you. So this is the biggest one, and so I'll compare all the ones to this. And the ones that are as big as him or close to, they're large, and the other ones are small. That's how I'm going to do it. It's pretty basic. So here's the first one. I'm going to match their rumps you know, together, and you can see he's a lot shorter, so he's small. This one, quite a bit shorter, so I'll call him small. It's too small, one large. This one's dinky, so that's a small. Three small, one large. This one, large, pretty much the same size. That's two large, three small. This dude, again, pretty much the same. So that's three large, three small. So far, so good. This one, he's nice and long, so he should, uh, he's kind of big, so we'll call him large. Come here, bloody things. This one, bit short, 
So we'll call him small. This one, small. This one, large. This one, small. This one, large. This one, small. This one, well, we'll call him large for now. I can see a big chunk missing, which may require um, something doing there. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Brilliant. So seven large, seven small. Brilliant. So I'm going to show you what I've done with arranging the skins. Okay. I think they look very good okay so this is the way i'm going to do them i've decided to join them rump to rump in this order this is the order that they will be in i think they match quite well of course it looks different when you're looking at it from the other way look at it like that as you can see the amount of snow on the rump matches quite nicely all the way through and so I'm quite happy with that. That's the best I can do, I think, with what's there. And once they're all joined, it'll look way better. And they're all trimmed to size. So that's the next thing we're going to do, is we're going to turn them all over, give them a number, so they all stay in this sequence when we sew them together. Okay, we'll do that tomorrow. So I've decided what order I want all the fox skins in. And uh, now I'm going to flip them over and number them so that I get them all in that order and I don't cut off the wrong edges. Okay. Here's a look at them now. This is the order that I want them in. All rumps together like that. Oh, my camera works good, isn't it? Okay, now we're going to number them. So here we go. I'm going to flip them all over in the order that they're in. Like this. You can number them any way you like. You could go 1A and 1B. <laughs> I often do that when I'm making garments like this. But usually with rugs, I'll number them 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So I'm just going to call this one 1. I just put a big 1 on it with my, uh, what do they call Bloody pencil. China graph pencil. 3. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, and fourteen. Okay, so this is the uh, pattern for the rug. And you've, we've just numbered it in this way, from 1 to 14. And the reason we do this is if we put them back, in, the, we don't muddle them up. 1 goes with 8, 2 with 9, 3 with 10, 4 with 11, and so forth. And we, for example, on number 1, we only cut these edges. Leave these ones with all the uh, skin on it. Uh, so that we can nail into this uh, salvage at the, at the side and not into the skin that we want to keep. We don't want to nail into here. We only want to nail into the bits we're going to throw away. So we leave all of these on. And uh, so that's what we're going to do. I used to be a draftsman, so I like to have a plan in everything I make. I like to have drawings to follow. I like to have some notes. It's a good idea. 
um, you know, it's all very well to have the image of it in your head, which you must do. You must have the finished image in your head about what you're going to do, but you absolutely should write things down and take notes because uh, in a business like this, I have to do fittings, I have to talk to staff, I have to have meetings, I have to make, I have to jump from one thing to the other. So let's say uh, I have to suddenly stop and uh, assemble a jacket. I have to put all this aside, and if it isn't all numbered and noted, when I go back to it, which might be in a few days or a week, I won't remember what I was doing. So uh, it's a good idea to write everything down. So if I follow the pattern here, this is skin number seven, as you can see, and seven we are going to cut off here and here, but we leave everything else. So we get our knife with a nice uh, clean blade in it, pierce the skin here, it's as thick as can be, and we cut off the side in one nice long stroke, no jaggy bits. Gone. Get rid of that, put that in my useful box, and this edge here. Voila. And then you just take a, a brush and you just get rid of the excess hair because you don't want to get it all bound up in the seams and makes a mess. There we are. So there's first one done. And then we just continue like that. So I'm just going to do it in, uh, in, uh, I'm going to do it very quickly for you. Just watch. laid them out in the order that they're going to be made up in. So it looks just like the pattern. So they're all numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. And so we're going to start joining them together. We're getting towards the good bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to join them rump to rump first like this. I'll pin them together so that I don't muddle them up like that and take them over to the sewing machine and start joining them together. Okay. The machine now and um, I've got all the skins down here and because I've pinned them it doesn't matter what order I do them in. Rump, it does matter in the next bit but when I'm just joining them rump to rump it doesn't matter. So it doesn't matter what order they're in. They're all pinned together so I'm getting the right one joined to the to its mate, and I'll show you how we do that. And here's the last one. I didn't want to show you all of them because it's the same thing over and over, but this is the very last one. This is one of the ones that goes on the end, so it's got the flags and bits and bobs on it. Thank you. 
those lines here. So it's just like the pattern. All of this is these bits I'm sewing now get cut off, these bits on the side. But they have to be there for the nail. I'll show you the nail. They've got to be there. Joined them all rump to rump like this. And now we're going to join them this way. And you'll see I've marked little green spots here. So I'm going to join them together like that. I've put there just little guide marks so that it's all nice and straight. Don't want wobbly bits. So yes, I'm going to now pin all of these together this way so I don't get them muddled up. Bring the pins in. Got three pins per row. So now I'm back at the machine and I've got it all pinned together and I'm going to follow all the little guide marks that I've um, marked along here. So I'll join them all there, join them all together and next time you see this it'll all be in one huge piece.
finished machining them all together. And here they are on the table. And the next step is to flatten the seams before we nail it. So this has to all be nailed so that all the skins take on the same surface tension. You can see that if you look closely at them, the joints are all wrinkly and it doesn't sit nice and, we want it nice and tight and flat and all the same. So if you have a look at it like it is, it's a little bit lumpy, but we're gonna change all of that. I'm gonna take our seam roller. And I'm going to flatten all the seams that we just sewed. This way we can also find any bits that I missed with the machine. Because I just sewed a whole lot of seams. So I want to make sure I didn't miss any. When I do this, anything I miss will be exposed. You don't want uh, any bits to open up when you nail. So here it is, um, I have sewn it all together and this is how it looks so far uh, with the lovely rump join all the way down the middle. Um, the shoulders are nicely matched as well so we've got a nice row of shoulder, uh, shoulder marks there uh, and a nice row of shoulder marks there, not as good as the other side but still nicely matched considering how how different they all were um, you know they're not perfect this one's a little bit hot but you know it's a natural wild animal and uh, I think it looks fantastic I'd love to leave it like this <laughs> with the raw edges but you know we can't uh, so anyway after lunch I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna nail it all and um, that's kind of we're getting close to the finished product which I think is absolutely beautiful. What a great use for an animal that's otherwise um, a menace. Fabulous. The next part of the process is nailing the entire rug. So we've now joined the entire thing together and we're going to nail it. And it's not too far to the end from here. So let's give it a go. So, we've got our bowl again, brand new, well, almost brand new bottle of methane. They should serve it chilled in the summer. Anyway, we'll need plenty of it to get this all wet again. It's like a cooking program, but you can't eat it. Just going to do it row by row like this.
as you can see, the rug has been nailed and is now dry. So the next thing is to take all the nails out. So let's do that next. The next step is to square the blanket um, and we're going to need some rulers and a big set square and um, some Chinagraph pencil and I'm going to square it up and cut it out. I'll do it in time lapse so it doesn't bore you to death, okay? Now that I've uh, put uh, my pencil line all around, I'm going to check it with my tape measure to make sure that it is uh, square after all, because we don't want it to sort of be all wobbly, we want it nice and square. So I'm going to run my tape measure over it and just check the, the need, if there needs some corrections, we can make that, okay. So I've measured uh, this here, the, the height of it. And uh, I nailed it at 111 centimetres, then nailed it. The nailing has increased it by a centimetre to uh, 112 centimetres. So this measures 112, the middle me measures 112, <clears throat> but at this end it's 111 and a bit. And so I've uh, opened it up a little bit more. I can't open it up at the other end because there's no skin left, but there's an extra centimeter there so I've brought the line down like that and now I'm going to check the width and hope that you can uh, see that I can move that a bit move the cameraman let's see what it measures this way it was nailed at 140 uh, 140 centimeters um, but it isn't uh, as big, it's 138 at this end. Uh, in the middle. Let's have a look. It's 138 and a, and a little tiny bit, but you know, roughly 138, pretty much the same. And up here, and this end, 138 and a half. Um, that's kind of close enough. I might just nip a little bit off there. You don't have to, but I just do that. And I taper that down towards the middle. So there's the middle there. That's all right. So just shave off a little bit there. there. So we know it's square and the size is 138 by 112 centimeters at this point. So let's go ahead and cut that out. Got my knife. Now the head skins, in this case, some of them are very heavy, so it might be a bit uh, heavy going. And uh, I think it's probably best if we do it on time lapse.
So here it is, all cut out. Flip it over. And there it is. Ta da! There's all your 14 skins all joined together. And now we're going to get into the finishing of the rug. Okay. What I've done uh, is I've given the uh, rug to Vlad, my assistant, to tape, and he's done a lovely job. I want to show you how he's done that. As you can see, he has bound the edges, done lovely little mitered corners there. He's uh, zigzagged them on. As you can see, he does it backwards and does a little locking stitch there. That's because he's a, a bit more clever than me. And also the tiniest, tiniest thread, the very fine thread. He's done beautiful work. And he's gone all the way around and bound the edges and uh, an absolutely magical job. Well done. But now I'm putting a spanner in the works and I've, I've decided that it doesn't really look complete. It looks a little bit measly because I was given 18 skins by the owner and six, two of them are absolutely unusable. And then another two are completely unusable. So out of the 18, I'm only using 14 and it does look a bit meagre. So what I've done is I've looked through my own supply of skins and I found some uh, foxes or pieces of foxes that sort of go together quite well. And I'd like to finish off the ends the way I would normally do if I had 16 skins. And I usually say 16 Australian foxes is kind of the minimum to get a nice looking throw. So I've put in two of my own. Um, I won't tell the customer that um, because, you know, nobody wants to hear that they're, the foxes they gave you weren't much chop. Um, well, two of them were no good. Uh, well, four of them were no good, but I don't want to tell them that. So what I want them to do is to get a really nice rug and they'll just go, oh, it's beautiful. And that's it. They've got a nice memory of it. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to add two foxes to the ends and I'll show you how I'm doing that. So I've attached the new ends and uh, I've wet the, uh, wet the skins with methylated spirits. I've wet the new skins and just the edge of the existing ones, which we've already nailed. I'm not going to wet the rest of it because it's already done. So we're going to uh, put it back on the board. I've remarked it to the finished size and uh, then we're going to nail the new bits so they take on the surface tension on the existing ones. So I'll do that for you on time-lapse and you can have a look at how I did it. Well, 
it's the next day and the rug is dry. So I'm going to denail it now and then we're going to clean it. The rug is now denailed and uh, the next step is to clean it. So I'm going to take it outside now into the cleaning shed because cleaning is a dirty business. And uh, as probably most of you know, uh, f fur is cleaned using sawdust. And of course, sawdust is very messy. Um, so I'm going to take it out to the shed and we'll have a look at how we do it. So we're in the shed with a cleaning drum, which I'll show you. So it's a, a rotating, uh, electrically driven uh, drum. Uh, full of sawdust. Now it's not just any old sawdust, but it is actually a uh, white wood flower. So it's a sawdust is very, very fine and uh, for cleaning purposes. So there's lots of different grades of sawdust and um, we'll use probably for this one, just the fine. We can also use a coarse one to beef it up and um, we'll see how we go. I'll show you. <laughs> There you go, it's rolling around. The tennis balls are making a bit of a racket. Normally I would take them out, but you know. So it's just gonna go around in there up for about half an hour, and then we'll come and uh, put it in the cage. Okay. The drum's still going around, and I'm just going to uh, switch it off. So what I'm going to do is remove the, the rug from the sawdust and put it in the cage. But I'm going to need both hands to do that. So you're just going to have to imagine the next bit. Open this. And then I'm going to fish it out, shake off the sawdust as we go. And then we're going to put it into the cage. Se uh, section next door okay so the uh, rug is out of the sawdust now it's all nice and clean and now I'm going to square up the new bits that I added on and then I'll get Vlad to tape it so those edges are nice and safe then we can put the lining on it fabulous and I'm squaring up the ends now so this is the blanket which we've already done and this is the bit we've added on and I want it to be nice and square so I've um, marked it up so basically I'm adding eight centimeters to this end and hopefully something similar to the other end Gonna make sure that this is square or done close to it. We'll have to settle for down close to it. Just twist it a little bit, but the eye will accept it as straight, I'm sure. Okay, that's all done. Quickly do the other end. I've marked up the new edging and now I'm just going to check that it's square and uh, then I'm going to cut it out, okay?
Just a little bit out on that corner. Looks nice that. And now we can cut it. Okay, so we take our blade, a nice fresh blade. And cut the edges. There it is. I think you'll agree it looks a lot better with this on the end. So it ties it all together and it brings it up to a much more pleasing shape. Um, it's now 127 centimeters this way 
and 137 and a half that way, so a much more pleasing square shape. Okay, now we have to uh, get these new bits taped and then we can start lining it. Now that the tape has been put on the edges of the new parts of the rug, I can go ahead and pipe it. So what we've done is we've chosen the fabric that we want to line it with, and we have made piping to go around the edge. I've already started it, and so um, I'll just keep going with it, and we can do it on time-lapse, and it looks so much more fun, and I wish it really was as fast as that in real life. Have you ever noticed that if you've ever opened an old garment, you'll find uh, areas like this, where you've got the natural skin here, and then you have this dark, seems to be painted or dyed section on the back of the skin. Um, those of you, there's a lot of you who probably know, but this is actually aniline dye. And the furrier has painted this section because the hair cover on the other side is thin. In this case, it's a silver fox and the flanks are used quite a lot. Um, but of course, if you peel the skin, if you open the skin like that, if there's white skin showing, that looks pretty horrible. So what they do is they paint the back gray and then it penetrates through here. And of course, when you turn the skin, you can't see anything. You can't see uh, any skin at all. So in the blanket we've just made, when we roll it around here and there you can see glimpses of white skin where the hair is thin and that's on the flanks of the animal and that's just normal with fox so what we have to do is we have to paint some aniline dye on the back same as we did here as they did you know 70 years ago we're going to paint some on the back it's a normal thing we do with fox flanks and um I'm going to show you how to do it. You can get actual aniline dye and do it, but I know a very good way of doing it, and that's just with RIT um, washing machine dye. So it's a liquid, and you mix it with methylated spirits into the strength that you want. You don't need much in the metho, and it, it dyes, it penetrates really quickly, and it dries really well. It's a very effective aniline dye substitute if you don't have any. So you can get that in brown and black and everything and you can dilute it to the shade you need it to be okay because you often see brown as well on the back of minks and and uh, brown foxes and things so anyway um right we'll get to that in a minute so you just take a little bit of the writ i've got 
some already mixed, of course, but I'm going to do this for your benefit. You just put a tiny little bit in like that into a jar. And then some methylated spirits. Aniline dye is usually diluted with isopropyl alcohol. But metho is a good one as well. So what we also need is a little bit of offcut from, from the fox. So this is a bit of offcut. And as you can see, in the flanks, it does get quite thin. It's not bald, but the hair is thin. So this is just a try out. Now we're going to mix it up. We don't want it to be really uh, dark. We just need it to be a, a decent mid gray. This one, this, that looks about right. So it didn't take much dye, but you do get a lot of coverage out of it. Just mix it up with this. I'll brush, you can use a pastry brush, you can use, this is one of my favorite brushes. Um, so look for a bald area there and we'll paint this on the back. Gone through this skin might be a bit uh, a bit oily. Might need a bit more metho in it. I think it's a bit dark. But as you can see, it's penetrated through and made the back of the skin a dark grey colour. It's still spreading through there, but now where it was white, it's gray, and the eye just accepts it isn't there. So I'm gonna add a little bit more metho to make it a bit, a bit more transparent. dries much lighter of course yes that's very good all right so now we can put it on the blanket this line signifies where the rumps meet and the area that we want to color is just up from the rump into these belly sections that are the, where the skin is uh, the hair cover is thin and the skin is also quite thin and just through there like that and we look on the other side we can see if you can see let's see where it parts like that um, it doesn't look too bad I mean it's natural but um, I'd rather that it was a that it was quite hidden so that's that section there so we just take the brush and we just apply the the die here and these sort of arch shapes because that's the shapes they take like that and when we look as you can see the white I don't know if you can see that if you do a close-up on it um, yeah you can't see the white skin anymore it's all gray beautiful now I'm going to go ahead and do the whole lot, um, but the, I'll just show you that one so you don't have to watch me do them all. But I'm going to do that here, and I'm going to do it here. On all the flank sections. So when the customer moves it around, they're not going to see, you know, these big flashes of white or pinky skin. They're going to just see nothing but fur. Beautiful. The next stage in the rug making is the finishing. It's the final bit. So we're now in the finishing room and I'm going to show you how we start. So here we're looking at the back of the skins and the first step is to add the polar fleece. So this is just a layer of polar fleece that Currently it's pinned on, but it will be sewn on by hand all across the back of the skins to give them body and a bit of uh, strength. 
here's the piping that we machined on and already we're pinning it now we don't uh, in this case with piping we don't turn it over like that that's what we do with tape but with piping we don't this way we can make it slightly bigger and all we do is just roll the fabric over that edge so it's currently pinned but this will be all pinned up as well and then it will be sewn down so we've got this nice rolled edge and then once all of that's done the lining goes over the top of that of course the lining is the same fabric as this which is very complimentary it also the the piping helps the rug stay nice and flat so while the finisher does it we'll watch it being done in time lapse so you can give some give you some idea of how it's all done final thing now that the lining is attached is the label the very very last thing that we do so here we go And the rug is finished finally i have done it all it's all lined it's labeled and it's ready to go to its new owner uh it's january here in melbourne and it says it's 35 degrees outside so they won't be using it anytime soon but out in the country where they live where the foxes were actually shot it's going to be cold in winter it's going to be damn cold so um let's hope they enjoy it let's have a look and here it is, it's all finished. We have all 16 foxes all joined, looking fantastic. Uh, I'm very happy with it, I've got to say. It looks amazing. Uh, the backing is beautiful. It has a beautiful woolen back. Uh, Bernadette's done a beautiful job piping it. The piping it uh, allows us, instead of turning the fur over like this, on a heavy lumpy fur like this, there's lots of texture to this side. We make the back very flat. So the finish lies beautifully flat, it's nicely weighted. It's also, of course, it's got the polar fleece on the inside, which gives it some body. 
So even though the foxes are all different, they're all feral foxes, the skins were probably taken in different winters. Um, I think most of them are male. Some of them were bigger than others. Some of them are big, a bit better than others. But we've done the right things to give it a cohesive look. So the furrier tricks that we've used, uh, besides the repairs and things like that, to give it a more unified look, because we don't have, in the case of farmed furs, beautifully selected match skins, we don't. So we've done the best that we can do. So we've taken the snowiest skins, the ones with the most silver on them, and put them in the middle. They're also round about the same size. They've got nice dark tips as well. And so they look very on purpose, like it, we meant to do it. The less red ones are on the outside. These four here and these four here. These ones, sorry, these are less snowy. They're a bit redder. Um, but when you put them all together, it tells a story. It's, there's a picture to it. So this takes the, the, the eye to the center because you've got a lot of symmetry here. And symmetry is what we really want in furriery. That's what we go for. We want it to look natural, but we also want everything to look its best. So the things that we've done, even though they're all different, we've made it look cohesive by doing a few uh, simple things. So you'll remember that we marked the center back on the back of each skin. That allowed us to match up all of these spine stripes and get this lo these lovely long, uh, lines going through it. We joined it rump to rump because they're all a little bit different in length So we chopped off the rumps of some but they all meet in this nice rump clash which looks very on purpose it Gives you a nice line down the middle uh, We put all the silver throats Down at the end so we get this lovely pattern along here that also lines up all the shoulders We've got these sort of a cross mark on the back of each fox and all the horizontals match up here. And then the last thing we have are the two long foxes at each end that have been split in half, creating a mirror image on each side. And that gives us a very cohesive look. It might seem like a lot of work, but you end it with something that looks so much better. If we were to run them one up the back of the other, all running the one way, then you'd have to cut off all the silvers here so that otherwise you'd have these, this big clash between the thickness of the rump and the flatness of the head with these white tufts. And it would look, I think, as my old teacher would say, it does not look well, John. It does not look well. This is a nice, uh, a nice way of making it. We've taken 16 skins uh, of feral foxes that would otherwise once they were shot, just to be hung up on a fence as a warning to other foxes. You've probably seen that by the sides of roads or just left in the paddock to rot. Uh, instead, we've taken the skins, which we once used to value and even export, and turned them into an heirloom that's going to last from this generation to the next and the next. Something that can stay in the family. This is going to a country property and this winter it's gonna keep the family nice and warm or whoever gets to sleep under it. So it's going to be a lot of fun for them for years to come. So I hope you've enjoyed uh, going through this with me and it may inspire you to make your own.